Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the AVPN webinar on using data to enhance social impact. My name is Kavita, and I'm the manager, knowledge, and member engagement at the Asian Venture Philanthropy Network, AVPN India. AVPN is a unique funders network committed to building a high-impact philanthropy and social investment community across Asia. Currently, we have over 600 plus members across 59 countries, and we are very pleased to have two of our members based in India speaking today. Representing Dhani Rural Information Systems, we have Swapnil Agrawal, co-founder and CEO, and Kinkri Roy Chaudhary, Asia Lead Accenture Development Partnerships. Swapnil will enlighten us with the need for data tech solutions for the social sector. Kinkini will take us through the examples of how data can be used to enhance impact in health, financial inclusion, and other sectors. Before we proceed, a few housekeeping instructions. We will not take any questions during the presentation, but will open up the floor for Q&A after the speakers have presented. Please feel free to use the console to type in your questions while the speakers are still presenting, and I will raise the questions to our speakers in the Q&A sessions. If you have further questions that are not answered by the end of the webinar, you can email them to us at india at avpn.asia. With great enthusiasm, I'll now hand over the presentation to Swapnil. Uh, thanks, Kavita. Uh, hello, all. Hi, I'm Swapnil. I represent here Dhwani Rural Information Systems. Uh, we are a data and technology consulting organization based out of India. Uh, I'll just check whether I'm being able to change the slides. Just give me a moment. Yeah. So just a quick uh, brief about us as an organization. We're a five-year-old organization into data and technology consulting with social purpose organizations. Uh, we work with multilaterals, government, uh, non-profits, social enterprises, CSR groups, foundations, and impact investors. Uh, sector work in most of the like education, livelihood, governance, inclusion, agriculture, Sanitation and health. Uh, we have done close to uh, in the social impact space. Uh, this is a slide where uh, I mean I would take some time to i mean i will spend some time on this slide to reflect uh, what are the common data and technology needs which we have encountered or we have experienced in our last five years so most of these uh, technology needs we would bucket them into either of these four uh, categories the first is office automation where we get requests where people would want to streamline their internal back office or office processes some examples are payroll hrmss accounting project management people would uh, ask us to revamp their website social media channels their internal communication and email tools that is the first bucket the second bucket is a project monitoring aspect to it uh, so what i mean by project monitoring aspect is that most of the uh, social impact organizations uh, whenever they would do, do a large program or a project, they would just want to monitor the project from a standard operating procedure point of view. So they would want to see that whatever the project entails, is it happening like that on the ground? So for example, how many beneficiaries have been reached out to, uh, how my uh, staffing and resource is happening, how my planning is happening, what are my targets, are what are the targets versus achievement figures? Uh, geographically, what is the spread? If there are certain workflows or activities to be followed, are they been happening or not? 
right? So it's pure from an operational monitoring lens. Uh, and uh, most of the organizations would want to have control of what is happening. So typical examples are where people would reach out to us to uh, create MISs, management information systems, or ERP systems where they can control the program, what's happening on the ground. So that's the second bucket. The third bucket is more from an impact lens. So whatever program or project an organization is conducting or implementing on the ground, how do you ensure that, or how do you measure the impact of that program? So if you have a log framework or if you have a, which, which entails your input, output, outcomes, activities, and impact indicators, or how do you do your baseline, midline, and endline? How do you define your impact indicators and align with your global reporting metrics like SDGs or PPIs or GRI or IRIS? So how do you evaluate or a simple terms of an m &E of your program through an impact lens? So that is, and that is also one of the requirements which we normally get. The fourth bucket is outreach. So what do we mean by outreach is, in most of the programs, there's a large component where you want to reach out either to your beneficiaries or if your internal uh, resources, I mean, you have a lot of resources, you have a lot of field force, you want to reach out to them for various purposes. So for example, let's say you are conducting a health program on the ground, which is spread across different provinces or states, and you have a field force of let's say 100 para health workers, there could be a requirement where you want to communicate with them and reach out to them and train them on certain aspect of, let's say a new health scheme which has come up, right? So you want to reach out to them and often doing uh, physical workshops or getting them in one place is very difficult. So you want an interface, for example, where you can push a small PPT or an animated video or some kind of a broadcast mechanism where they could read, they could take some quizzes and get back so that you are ensured that the content has been delivered to them. In some cases, let's say you want to reach out to your beneficiaries uh, with some content. So this is all comes under outreach. A classic examples being if you want to spread awareness, if you want to do training, uh, you want to do a counseling. So for example, in India, a lot of uh, nonprofits or organizations are working in the adolescent space where sexual and reproductive health counseling is one of the major key areas. So one of the very classical example is a chatbot, right? So a lot of organizations are trying to build a chatbot which has pre-configured content where an adolescent can enter and he or she can feel safe and ask questions without being judgmental or without any bias. So all those things comes under outreach. So with this slide, what we're trying to uh, focus on that most of the requirements which come from an organization are either uh, a combination of these or standalone of these. So whatever solutions we develop, whether they are a part of a SaaS platform or they could be a standalone of the, I mean, a scrap or grounds up system would have one of these of these components. The first uh, bucket where there is this office automation is something which we don't focus much on because th this is something which is very well organized and you have a lot of open source or off the shelf tools readily available. So something like accounting is readily available uh, everywhere. Okay, moving on to the next slide. So if you see the major contributors to technology space that why technology mainstream and otherwise in the social space has now been picked up has been because of the four contributors or four miracles if you see for the ICT for development space. One is affordability and availability of smartphones or mobiles. Second is availability of internet, uh, whether it is broadband or whether it is your 3G or 4G internet which is uh, available. The third is availability of uh, virtual servers. So no more you have to house those big boxes of physical servers. You can, I mean, create getting an AWS or a DigitalOcean server account is as simple as getting an email account. And fourth is the new age emerging technology. Uh, some examples are AI, ML and blockchain, which is catching up and finding a lot of use cases in the social sector. So just wanted to focus on like what we mean by emerging tech. 
So the examples of artificial intelligence, blockchain, machine learning, IoT, all come under the emerging tech domain. These are very few examples of some emerging tech examples. I'll just take a minute to explain one of, one of these two. The first one is a uh, app from Child Growth Monitor coordinated by Wealth Hunger Life and Microsoft Research, where uh, in India, in, a use, in the use case in India, that in India, uh, you have child care centers called Anganwadis, where children are being screened for anthropometric parameters. So what is their mid-arm circumference? What is their mid-head circumference? Height for weight, weight for height and all that. Normally what happens is with your normal instruments like your height measurement instrument or a weight uh, measurement instrument, a lot of these is not taken correctly and it is then not being inputted correctly. So here is an app wherein you can place a child and have a 360 degree video of the child and because they have a huge database or a library of such images and videos they would benchmark it and using a machine learning algorithm they would automatically calculate the anthropometric measures that is the first example the second example is a uh, chatbot which i was saying with a sexual and reproductive health available as where there's a virtual a fictitious doctor character being created uh, who would advise you on the sexual and reproductive health content and it is a safe space It is available on Facebook messenger. This is public as well You can actually use these links to do that. The third was in as an IOT based uh, Locket which has been experimented by Khushi baby here in India in parts of Rajasthan Which helps someone to identify a child. So in normally health screenings profiling a patient is very uh, is a problem I mean you don't have unique IDs I mean, Aadhaar is there, but you don't have any other unique ID. So you can use an IoT based system like this, where you can just tap your mobile and previous statistics of the patient could be taken. Moving on to the next slide. Uh, yeah, so the, uh, these are some blocks. I will just take a minute to explain. So uh, here's a larger focus that when do you want to see that you are ready for technology? So, I mean, normally we recommend organizations when they approach us that they need a technology. So if your scale is not very large, if it is fairly low and the, the program has not achieved certain scale. So what do we mean is that if your program is still in an iterative process, you should not go for a technology solution. You should still continue using Google Sheets or off the self systems, which are readily available and try out with them. Once your program achieves maturity, you are certain that yes, this is the workflow of my program. This is how uh, uh, this is how a user will have its journey and all that. You should do that. Once this is everything is done, then you should approach a technology vendor or a technology partner and get into conversations of building a technology solution grounds up. That is one. Second is in most of these cases, it's very important that you approach a partner who also has some domain expertise and understands your program. If not, you should dedicate a full time person who is able to tell the partner or provide complete workflow or specs of what is going to be built. Because most, in most of the cases, technology partners would come with a lens of technology. They would not have the, your domain understanding or your process flow understanding. So that is something which you need to align so that the system which is being built is ultimately used by the beneficiary. I mean, in your case, maybe a field worker or the beneficiary. So, and also you should include them in your design, which is a user centric design approach. <clears throat> so uh, getting into this the impact investors thing. So a lot of uh, recently what has happened is a new uh, domain of clientele is coming to us is impact investors. A lot of impact investors are now asking us that uh, in the past they have been only collecting data from their portfolio companies across financial or business metrics, but they have not been able to collect data on impact matrices. So now what we are doing is through our platforms, we are helping them to design impact questionnaires for their portfolio companies and helping the portfolio companies to fill up those questionnaires or assign values to the questionnaires so that at a, at a portfolio company level, the companies can able to see their impact and also from an impact investor level, they can also see and uh, visualize an impact at a larger portfolio level and also can dissect them at different domains level. For example, in health, what is their impact? In livelihoods, what is their impact? 
they can do slide and dice through a geography and also go through a SDG based cancer. Uh, I think that is my time. Happy to take uh, any questions uh, after this. Uh, over to you, Kinki. Thank you, uh, Swapnil. Okay, so quick a snapshot of what Accenture Development Partnerships is. We are part of the bigger consulting firm Accenture. And uh, our aim is to bring what we do for our commercial clients in terms of the strategy, consulting, digital and technology, uh, all of that into the development sector. Our expertise is in agriculture, energy, financial inclusion, health, humanitarian response. And we are a global firm uh, in present in 90 countries, 200 offices um, have worked with multiple donors, international NGOs, and also increasingly with the private sector. Uh, sorry, yeah. Now, data for development, uh, to put it in simple definition, it is a data, it's data that is aggregated from various sources, various sectors to address the social needs and that can positively impact uh, the lives of people. There is a certain uh, distinction in, um, in the data that we use today. It's uh, characterized by three Vs, if I may. Uh, one is there's a greater volume of data that's getting generated, be it on hunger, be it on education, gender equality, child mortality, maternal health. So the volume is big. There is more variety. So we've moved beyond just the you know, climate data and we're now almost tracking everything. What we heard from Swapnil, it is a, an indication of where all data has percolated. And also the rate at which uh, this is, the rate and of velocity by which we can reach the data and aggregate the data is much, much, much higher, which is what I think uh, leads us to the question of big data. And big data is characterized by say, a few features. One is that it, it, it is definitely not that is manipulated by people and you know manual data is put into Excel files. So that's that's not what we mean. And um, the, uh, the effort that Accenture is constantly making is how can we make this data to be created digitally so that there is no manual entry of data and it is not manipulated by the computers or the handlers of data. The second is how can we make data a byproduct of the interaction with the service? So just like um, you know, we, we say put a like on Facebook um, or we view a page on um, Instagram, how can it profile me? Similarly, how can we profile a beneficiary by the interaction of various digital services? Uh, the third way to categorize, I would say, uh, this big data will be uh, that it automatically extracts and stores itself when it's generated. Um, and that I will come to it uh, in a bit, explaining you, explaining to you how it works in one of our projects that we deliver. Also, it is geographically or temporally trackable, which is to say that we can probably, for instance, in case of a mobile phone, uh, be able to locate the data all the core duration time. So uh, we should be able to tag it to a particular location or a time and one that can be constantly analyzed, which is to say it is relevant, it is real time, and it is not where we are, you know, where the information gap of the data being generated versus it being collected is anywhere between one to five years. In certain cases, such as education, it might be even longer. So uh, with that promise, I think uh, when we move to data for development, we are um, we're trying to sort of give to you this landscape. And this is something that um, we've done in collaboration with few of our clients. We've looked at the uh, various different thematics, gender, humanitarian response. And what you see there is there are these collaboratives or international NGOs or certain government and private sector led agencies that are now looking at data governance models. And this data is, of course, going to be big data, but there are also conversations on this data being open data with the difference between I'm, I'm hoping people know, but just to clarify, big data has its level of access. Um, and it's not available to everyone. It cannot be manipulated or uploaded by everyone. Uh, whereas open data, 
uh, sort of is a is a scrubbed form of is a scrubbed uh, data set which can be available to everyone who can have access to it so uh, that's the difference so most of these agencies those start with the big data they are now moving towards the concept of a public digital platform which can then have an open data source um, sort of um, setup now just to give you a few uh, highlights about how does this landscape look i think most of the domain perspective most of the initiatives on data are focused on health gender equality and livelihoods um the most mature in terms of data gathering and development and using those insights to inform policy is environment and sustainability there is little um or i would say with smart metering it's probably increasing but energy water and sanitation solutions are the one that are sort of left behind in terms of using data uh, and uh, taking it to um taking it to inform uh, actionable insights so in that uh, data can then be tapped not only from the mobile phones that we use or uh, you know the call records it can also be utilized from say tablet tablet based data collection or from satellite imagery uh, and there are various other innovations being tested on what else would qualify to be data there are of course a few concerns um, around adhering to legal ethical and quality standards uh, and in this it is again imperative for multiple actors to come together and work out the interrelated um, you know uh, interrelated uh, questions challenges so that these data solutions can be scaled and more and more partners can get into the collaborative so with that i will uh, probably talk a little bit more about uh, about the last one here is project 8 right so this is a project that we worked on uh, along with our clients this was funded by the uh, gates foundation and it was uh, bas it's basically a platform that um, looks at congregating data from various sources and the intent is that can we enable access to various different partners and uh, make sure that everyone uh, has uh, can this can be a global platform that serves as a repository uh, for data exchange as well as um, information exchange so p8 as a uh, project 8 as the name suggests is the planning that we did for uh, the next set of humans that will be part of the earth which is 8 billion people uh, and hence p8 uh, it is it it is for it started off with about six organizations and they were compiling 30 data sets which included uh, data around uh, you know food and health and agriculture but very disparate but uh, right now the platform houses more than 300 million rows of data and it's growing daily and uh, it now supports about 100 organizations in 16 countries and uh, the intent of this is that it is uh, hosted i mean it, it it is of course uh, fed by the data of its members it's cloud hosted uh, and it's also optimized for mobile so even if you are in the remotest place of earth and even if you are trying to uh, input data from your mobile phones you, if you are a member of project 8 you should be able to upload discover and use the kind of data um, in terms of monitoring um from all over the world right so that's uh, that's basically one of the big projects that we did it's again available online if you want to look up uh, about project 8 and the data collaborative uh, that we've developed uh, the the second project that i probably would want to talk about is um yeah this one around accenture remote uh, patient monitoring system now this is a innovative solution in which we've partnered with a lot of healthcare startups in order to create something like a digital plaster so if you can see that little plaster on the bottom right here uh, that's a wearable and this is for a, a patient to monitor their vitals anytime anywhere and it is of course a, a connected device which can 
be uh, which can be feeding in real time information to the hospital and uh, to be able to provide tertiary patient handling services without significant investments it's also um, for hospitals to provide you know more 24/7 uh, monitoring and not on bed services so it's it's easier on the pocket for uh, for the patient as well as for the capacity utilization of the hospitals especially in the public healthcare domain um it becomes all the more important it's uh, it's something that we've sort of uh piloted right now in karnataka and uh, the early results are definitely telling us that it can be applicable to more underserved and vulnerable populations because usually at uh, many a times the time that it takes for them to come to the hospital is the time that is uh, of real loss so if there is something that one can do by monitoring the vitals and possibly having some proactive action before they arrive at a hospital and also for patients getting discharged after their surgeries after uh, complicated illnesses and prolonged stay in the hospitals it can deliver cost savings to both hospitals as well as save lives um another example that i probably would want to talk about is uh sorry why is it going that way is uh this one it's it's basically ai for um for financial inclusion we worked with the grameen foundation and in this uh it's an app and uh, it's fairly simple in which field agents that are working with uh people in rural geographies and those who are not really literate and those who cannot use their apps as efficiently as we do um we may be able to um we may be able to understand what are their uh, current challenges and what is it that they want to uh, see in term in terms of uh, modification of services offered to them on financial inclusion this is a ai based app like i said it uh, supports natural language processing so people who access this app can actually speak in their native language and it can do a speech to text conversion where uh, you know ai chatbot will actually prompt them to an answer that answer will be translated in the local language which can be either read out or it can be spoken to and uh, the way that it works is uh, when we record these voice messages from our customers Uh, we are also running an emotional analytics um, to gain some real time insights into the emotional and cognitive status of the target group which is to say if there is a woman in distress and she says uh, i don't know which uh, loan is good for me i have been struggling with um, some loan sharks so and so forth so um, it is very intuitive uh, for us to analyze the emotions and in certain cases also detect whether she was pressurized to take on a few financial responsibilities whether she feels that she'll not be able to repay but she is applying for this loan under pressure so uh, there are certain uh, actionable insights for these field agents to be um, then guiding the decision making for uh, for actually getting um, getting uh, get actionable insights in terms of uh, making sure that these solutions are or uh, customize we rolled it out in maharashtra and orissa and the grameen foundation uh, has reached out to about uh, 3 lakh people local people in these uh, two states and what has really worked is because of this app it has enabled grameens agents to now devote themselves to more challenging work of outreach and asg formations and so on and uh, most of the intuitive query handling as well as uh, grievance redressal is uh, done through this app i have about a minute but i'll hand it back to you uh, kavita thank you kinkini and swapnil uh, we will now take questions from the audience uh, i can see some of the raised hands but i request the attendees to kindly type in the questions so that i can then read them out to the presenters i'll start with uh, the first question that i have how can we ensure efficient use of data and tech 
when most of the SPOs have inadequate IT resources. Uh, Kinkini, would you like to answer that? Yeah, um, so in my mind, it is not a question to be solved at every organization level, which is why if you remember the slide that I had used in terms of the collaboratives, right? Um, sorry, I don't have the control, but if you remember that slide where I had that landscape, I think what is important is for uh, various um, yes, yes. So if you see, and you are like an NGO that's working in the space of agriculture, I think it's important to be part of those data and health collaboratives. And uh, right now, there are a lot of organizations like Microsoft that are also loaning out softwares um, to very small NGOs. So I would say two things. One is don't think about this problem as your own problem it is a sector level problem so can you be part of a sector level collaboration and second is uh, look for the organizations that are now very readily uh, helping our ngo on ground ngo partners improve their uh, capacities by software capacity building so on and so forth There, there's one question uh, which says, I want to know the app for measuring a child's anthropometric measurements. Uh, did uh, Sapnil, did you show it in your presentation? Oh, yes. So would you like to answer? Uh, yeah, so I think, yes. So I think two organizations uh, are working on this. One is the child growth monitor. So I can uh yeah so so yeah you can go on to childgrowthmonitor.org that's an actually an open source project uh you can try this out i am not sure when is their first release but i think one of their uh, alpha beta releases is already there uh this is one which you can try that out the other one is uh, vadhani ai is also doing a similar work so you can also reach out to vadhani ai for the same i hope i answered it if there's anything else uh, i mean if you want many details happy to the next question, uh, I think this is for you, Kinkini. Uh, what has been your experience in getting users, such as counselors, field level staff, to adapt tech solutions? Have you experienced any resistance? How was it overcome? I think uh, both Kinkini and uh, Swapnil, uh, you can answer one after the other. Sure. I can go first. Uh, I believe that 80% of that can be resolved at the design stage. And um, I am um, I am a big believer of designing for the user. So whenever we've gone and designed something for an ASHA worker or a agri field agent or an agri entrepreneur, we've always always uh, done a lot of immersion, stayed with them, walked their uh, path, uh, lived their lives for three to four days to be able to understand exactly what problem are we solving. We've then followed a very rapid prototyping approach, which is to say we just do a half-baked solution and give it to the users and ask them to thrash it out. So they even tell us uh, font bada kar do, size, uh, color, yellow nahi chalega. And that's how we really design a solution. So like I said, we try and overcome that resistance in the design phase uh, to a large part. However, for retrospectively, um, fitting a solution to need uh, to the needs of uh, some of the user i believe some of it can then be tackled by better awareness and uh, you know iec efforts but uh, i would say the that isn't most optimum uh, yeah yeah so i think yeah building upon what can can you say i think very rightly said that uh, the humor center design or the user centric approach is the key to this. So unless we get uh, our primary users in our case who could be field uh, users at any level, be it agri entrepreneurs or CRPs or your health workers, we have to include them in the design phase and make sure that what is in it for them. So in most of the cases, what we have seen is uh, a lot of these apps are completely built in the boardrooms in consultation with the technology partner and the program manager and they are just being pushed down to the uh, field level workers where we see a lot of resistance for them so if they are included in the design phase they feel that yes their opinion is being taken this is something for them 
and this is not a added burden for them right so this is something which would help them in their day to day work or this is something which would uh, reduce their workload and all that one of the other reasons which we have seen we have seen a major pushback is that a lot of community uh, i mean uh, the field workers perceive this technology as a watchdog so in most of the cases where we have gps or where we ask them to click photos so that perception is something which by by trainings and awareness we have to crash it out because they should not be perceived as a watchdog that we are just giving them an app because we don't have a confidence in them or trust on them so they uh, should give uh, data to us so i think that is the second thing the other thing is if we get some people champions or early adopters of our uh technology system or apps what happens is then those people only further train the uh other field workers so then it becomes something which is very internal to them and uh, then there is not a lot of push or a training or a uh, awareness required from the organization side wow. yes so this is from my side okay the next question is um can we use the existing uh, data pool which is there with the government and um, the census and can the funders and ngos use this to design and deliver better program on the ground so basically i think uh, someone wants to know whether this data can also be utilized in the data tech that uh, you are suggesting Kinkini, would you like to go ahead? Uh, sorry, uh, I couldn't really understand the question. If you can come back to it, I mean the public data sources that are available with yes. the government. Yes. 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 Uh, so yes, of course. I mean, the public data sources can definitely be used, and uh, you know, most of the macro analysis and um, in terms of understanding where does the real I mean, the initial opportunity assessment of um, an intervention can definitely be done by the government data sources. And uh, many a times, even for our NGO clients, when we look at their uh, thematic area prioritization, we oftentimes look at where is the government money going and uh, try to follow, uh, you know, the investments that the government has made. Um, more often than not, it will correlate with the kind of data that we publish. And I think uh, in terms of even, and this is a call out for uh, to our NGO partners, when we think about the bigger question of attainment of SDGs, I think it's important that we have a voice and advocate around uh, the government to publish the right kind of data. Uh, if you look at one of the collaboratives that has started, um, that was started by UN Women, and it's again on that landscape, is uh, make every girl and woman count. So, which is to say that uh, about 41% of the governments uh, are not reporting or rather not satisfactory yeah. uh, gender metrics. Similarly, there might be certain metrics the governments are not reporting today. I think uh, as a sector, instead of just relying on what the government publishes, we should also take on the responsibility to inform the government what they should publish over a period of time. So if there are uh, both sides to the equation. Swapnil, would you like to add in? Yes, so I think definitely, uh, as Kinkini mentioned, for an initial analysis or to do an opportunity or an assessment, I think uh, secondary data sources like whatever government has open data sources, like in India, I think one of the key repositories is data.gov.in. We can get a lot of data sets, but often uh, what we have seen is uh, government, most of the government uh, departments or different ministries. Uh, Proper data structures are not being followed. So you would see uh, there are no unique IDs. There's no proper segmentation of data. So often those, often that data is not uh, usable. So I give you an example. So let's say, uh, so currently we are working on a project where we are trying to get some data on Narega, which is the National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, and we have to get data from different state websites. So all different government state websites are uploading that Nariga data on their respective websites. But if you download uh, data from different websites, state websites, it is not in a format where you can collate because each uh, state government website is following a different format. So I think, yes, I mean, to a level, you can try that out. You can use it. Uh, 
but it depends upon the complexity and it's very subjective to the solution you are trying to do that but yes it is uh, i mean as an initial step yes we can uh, we should always look for data which is already available in public and government data sources are i mean one of the key or the primary resources to do that uh, can can you sir the next question is for you uh, can you explain more on project 8 uh, what data you are collecting and what measurement metrics are you using and how does one join the platform right so you know it's it's right uh, on the accenture website in terms of what exactly project 8 is and uh, we are collecting like i said data from health sector from education from humanitarian crisis from um <coughs> from environment gender all sorts of data sources and also it has been um, powered by organizations such as nielsen which already has a lot of proprietary research data salesforce mm -hmm. um has has its own proprietary data sets and then um we we sort of have worked together in order to uh, not only make this a platform where you can collate the data or you know upload the data but can be also able to access the various sources of data in order to uh, get uh get access into it uh, you just have to go to demandinstitute.org and there is project 8 login i don't know if you guys can receive a link but i can try to i can try to put something on the chat where you can see it let me know if you can see it yeah i've just put it there so that's the membership link okay the next question is uh, how do you ensure unique identity for a child is there a chip that is involved um, can you please explain in details so i think uh, swapnil this is about the khushi baby project oh uh, yeah so i think this is uh, an rfid uh, sensor which has been put on a locket which is culturally accepted in that community and the phone is equipped with a rfid reader uh, which reads the unique profile of the baby and based on that uh, it pulls out the previous information and then you can build up on and do the child profiling but i think if you want to know more details because it is a khushi baby project i think you can always log on to khushi baby uh, website and find out more information but in most cases uh, that is an rfid uh, sensor which they have been using other options uh, for unique profiling in india what people use is a unique identification id which is could be an aadhar or like like a social security id or in one of the projects we also used a qr code which we had printed and laminated and put on infrastructures like we were doing watershed mapping so we had put uh, qr code uh, stickers which which were laminated and put across on the Uh, walls of the watershed structures so those are some examples if there are uh, individuals involved you can do biometrics as well but then you get into the cost of carrying a biometric device plugging it into a uh, phone and all that yes i think these are the only uh, use cases for a unique id which can do okay the next question is uh, how can we support the government or policy makers in enhancing quality of data production and sharing Kinkini, would you like to go first? Yeah, absolutely. So, like I said, uh, right now, the systems that our governments have uh, designed over the past many many years, they have all been manual data entry systems. And as evolution, tech evolution would have it, we've not really thought about um, making. data collection different we've just said we'll keep on collecting the data the same way which is on pen and paper and then we'll digitize it um some others have gone forward some other ngos or organizations have gone forward and also created apps in which we've only made the paper registers digital so now instead of entering it uh, manually well, we enter it digitally um and that's something but what i'm really talking about is for um for our sector partners to 
make data a byproduct of interaction, like I said, so which is where using things like IoT sensors, um, image capturing becomes very, very important because uh, in that there is no manual data collection. Just to give you an example, what we did for one of our um, one of our NGO partners was uh, when the Anganwadi workers, they have to take attendance for their kids. And, you know, every day those registers to be filled and uploaded every month and so on and so forth. So one way to do it is uh, instead of writing down their names, you do a check mark. The way we completely transformed it is we said, uh, you know, we upload a database of photographs of the kids uh, and um, we keep refreshing it every four months because these kids grow up quite fast. But uh, all the Anganwadi worker has to do is hold up her camera phone and uh, basically rotate it around the room, right? And by facial recognition, attendance is taken. So all I'm trying to say is we have to think about smarter ways in which data collection is done and captured so that there is no need for retrospective scrubbing of data. Trust me on having worked on multiple data projects now, 70% of our time is to get the data in order and only 30% on the value added analytics. So as a sector, we need to become far more creative about the way we collect data. Sapnil, would you like to add in? Uh, yes, so I think government, I would say government, uh, there has been already a lot of effort. There's already a open data sharing policy with the government. The government is urging all departments to share data in a format which is machine readable. Uh, doesn't mean that you scan the PDFs and put it up on your website. So all those is happening. One example I would give you is that specifically in the health sector, there's a guideline called an NDHP guidelines, which is National Digital Health Blueprint, which has been released. We are one of the alliances. I mean, we are one of the partners to that alliance, where government is saying that any health app which is being built should follow those NDHP guidelines. A very simple example is that they are saying that we will have an API where if you want to fetch any nearest health center, whether it's a PHC or a community health center or a sub-center, or other center, you should fetch through an API only. You should not build your own databases or you should not build your own masters and things like that. So I would say already the thought is there, the government is trying to push, but yes, there are certain organizations as well. There are certain nonprofits as well. And it's really a, I don't know, it's really a people movement and an organization movement where uh, whatever, and it's, it's also a responsibility of any ecosystem partner who is operating in this space as Kinkini mentioned that their job is not just to digitize whatever is happening on pen and paper but ensuring that whatever data collection or data structures they are doing it is also in a format that next time if anyone wants to build something over top of it or get or share it it's machine readable it has basic hygiene like api readability and all that it's already there and they follow uh, accepted common data format, which is, I mean, accepted in the technology domain. It's not just that you just digitize your stuff. So from the government end, it's already happening, but yes, we will have to push whenever we work with these, uh, the government agencies. Okay. The next question is, uh, what percent of the project fund should, uh, go towards data and tech for the investment to be impactful? Well, I don't have an answer to that. Uh, it's really, the answer is depends. But uh, instead of percentage, uh, you know, investment, I would say percentage uh, in the design phase, and that should be a good 30 to 50%. Um, the time and effort required to incorporate uh, digital and technology into program design, scale up plans, uh, that that has to change, but I'm not very sure whether to put a number on what percentage of investment. Sapnil, would you like to add? Yes, so I think as I agree to what Kinkini said, I think very difficult to put a number or a percentage to it. Uh, but definitely in the design phase or when we are trying to uh, put together program guidelines, the theory of change and all that, a lot of thought and a lot of effort has to go into what kind of data are we collecting, is it just being collected from a 
control or a reporting point of view or whatever data we collect are we actually going to use it will it have an impact and all that so that is something which we have to do and also in a lot of fun i mean so one thing which has now come up is that we have seen a lot of funding organizations or donors have incorporated something like call i mean they commonly call as tech or mis budget or grants so they say some amount of money uh, whatever in the program design should be kept aside to ensure that the data and technology needs of this program are being built in. Uh, so typically what happens in our case also, uh, we get involved at a very design phase. So our nonprofit partners or the social organizations we work with would just call up and say, hey, I have a program which has just been started in two months. We'll be starting in two months. This is a program which will be happening across these many states. Uh, can you help us design the data and tech architecture of this so that in the long term we know how do we start with so then you have to build an it roadmap you have to build a data and tech roadmap initial i mean we are okay i mean uh, it is okay that if you don't start with an app on day one uh, but at least you should know what data is to be collected who will be collecting why are you collecting that data what is the format in which the data is being collected all those uh, i mean brainstorming and all that uh, bouncing of ideas has to be done at the design phase okay the next question is um, is it possible to ensure real time and authentic data on agricultural yield through data tech uh, i think kinkini you had an example yeah i did and there are various uh, ways to do it because agriculture across its value chain has uh, various modes uh, or various nodes in which you can be tracking data so right from um, studying the uh, the the weather condition of which various data sources are available to uh, to the soil condition to the irrigation levels to uh, the health there are a lot of image analytics solutions out there that will tell us whether the crop is infested um, and uh, what should be the remedial measures it will also tell us what amount of fertilizer what kind of fertilizer is needed and um, in that the yield is sort of impacted then of course there's the end uh, value chain which is to the off takers and there are multiple solutions out there that are open access to farmers for marketplaces. And um, I believe uh, uh, this apart from storage solutions as well, especially when it comes to uh, fruits and vegetables, there are a lot of cold chain monitoring solutions which are enabled by IoT sensors that collect the temperature data from time to time, uh, that collect the optimal travel time, so on and so forth. So multiple solutions out there. There's something called, look it up on, uh, on the web, Accenture Connected Crop and Precision Agriculture Solution. It will give you an idea about exactly where all can data be aggregated uh, to impact the yield. Swapnil, would you like to add? So I think uh, when you say uh, you want to collect data, I mean, how do you ensure that authenticity of data at the yield level? Uh, I think uh, some examples, I think if you want a foolproof solution, I mean, uh, distributed ledgers or blockchain really is the answer to it. But I personally, I mean, it's my personal bias. I, I don't really know that on lab scale, uh, distributed ledgers of blockchain and agriculture have, you have a lot of examples in India or even in Africa or other cases, but I don't see they have gone up to a level where, uh, I mean, they have moved beyond a pilot. Uh, so it all, it all depends upon how, what is the mechanism where you are collecting data. Uh, if, uh, I think as Kinkini mentioned in one of our slides, if data is a byproduct of an interaction, Yes, then I think what happens is that the person who is giving you data is not actually giving you data, it's just interacting with the interface or an app or the workflow, and data is just a byproduct. So there, I think you can still, the authenticity of the data, you can still rely on. Uh, but in most cases, I think it all boils down to the motivation, awareness, and how do you uh, ensure that the field workers who are giving you data, it could be farmers as well in this case, who are themselves giving you data, how do you uh, incentivize them? I'm not saying financially, but how do you ensure that what is in it for them if they report correct data or if they give you data uh, which is absolutely uh, validated? Uh, so, I mean, you can have GPSs, you can have image analytics and all that, but still people can may 
try find a way to dodge that around. But I think uh, if you see the uh, human aspect to it, it all boils down to uh, how how are you ensuring that the person who is giving you data is actually making sure that what is in it for him or her when they give you correct data. Right. Um, I would be taking the last question, uh, which is uh, we would love to integrate impact data measurement in our NGO work. And I'm interested in knowing which IT platforms are free for trial. Swapnil, would you have uh, any answer for this? Uh, so I think if uh, so, this I think this we'll have to break this into two, three parts. So if you are saying that you already have impact indicators, I am making an assumption here that you already have an impact indicators. Uh, then if you want to align it to let's say SDGs or something, then there are SDG tracker tools online available. <laughs> uh where you can do that where you can define your own impact indicators and then align to sdgs and then see an sdg wheel or an sdg tracker to do that uh, that is the first assumption answering this question the second assumption if you haven't defined your impact indicators and you just have let's say an output or outcome and all that then i think you can use tools like any bi tools like a mix of google sheets and google studio you can get up on the tableau or you can use power bi or I mean, if you have some developers or an IT team in your in-house, you can set up something like a superset or a metabase, which are open source uh, data visualization softwares. So I think, yeah, I mean, given the context of this question, I think I can only answer this. If I have more details, I can look up into and Okay, in the interest of time, we'll not be able to take in any more questions. So I would like to thank uh, everyone for your participation in this interesting session. And thank you very much, Kinkini and Swapnil. Uh, we will post the webinar recording on our website by next week. So please look out for it. Uh, the AVPN conference 2020 is being held at Singapore from 9th to 12th June this year. Uh, the theme of the conference is the power of networks. We will be covering many interesting discussions regarding social funding and investment in Asia. The registration is now open. Please visit conference.avpn.asia and register. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for getting us together. Thanks, Swapnil. Thank you, Kinti. Thanks for the talk.